Welcome to, today, to today's webinar in the Knowledge Mile series, part of the Lord Mayor's Lectures, on behalf of Alderman Professor Michael Minelli, whose theme for his mayoral year is Connect to Prosper. In this free online lecture series, we address the connections in and around the square mile, what Michael likes to call the world's coffee house, and how these might help us to tackle future global challenges. I'm Professor Tim Connell, Chairman of the Gresham Society, and a Fellow of Gresham College here in the City of London, and I'm also a liveryman of the Stationers Company. I'll be convening this session and moderating the questions and answers after today's lectures. So we have a plan today, quick introduction from me, the keynote presentation from John Meggett, and then we have about 20 minutes for questions. Today we have a very interesting topic, getting kids to care about culture, and I'm delighted to welcome John Meggett, CEO of Arcade XR and an AI entrepreneur. So John, can you tell us something about yourself? Yes, thanks Tim. Hi, yes, I'm John, uh, CEO of Arcade XR. We're based in Clerkenwell and we've been going for about seven years. Uh, before that, I was the uh, CEO of a digital agency called Fuse and before that, trained as an architect, which I'm going to tell you a bit more about in a minute. Okay, so now, can you tell us more about how you get kids to care about culture? Over to you. Thanks, Tim. Yes. Um, so I'm going to talk about technology uh, today, two technologies in particular, but talk about them through the lens of this mission uh, of getting kids to care about culture. This is a mission that's close to my heart and close to my company's heart. Um, but before I start, um, just going to ask a quick question. Uh, if anyone can think what's missing in this sentence, uh, excessive indulgence in is injurious to the young. It exhausts the eyes, debilitates the body, and overstimulates the imagination. So what device is missing there? We'll come back to that at the end. But we're going to start at the beginning, and the beginning is architecture school. And actually, I bumped into my mother-in-law earlier today, and uh, she informed me she was going to attend this lecture. So I'm going to be on my best behaviour. Uh, she's an architect, and is bound to spot where I'm going to go wrong here. But anyway. Um, I trained as an architect. I met uh, my good friend and co-founder, Simon Hobbs, uh, in Nottingham University. We're not quite old enough to feature in this photo, um, but we did train on, I think we were one of the last generations of architecture students to train on A0 drawing boards. And um, at the same time, we were also spending a lot of time in the CAD lab and we were training on computers. And really uh, developed a passion and, and dare I say, expertise in using computers to create digital experiences. And after six years of this, we uh, moved on. And some might say it's because we weren't that great at architecture, um, but we like to think otherwise. But whatever the reason, we actually set up a digital agency in the mid 2000s. Uh, this is a shot of our Soho studio before we moved. And um, we had a lot of fun um, with a mixture of good luck and hard work. Uh, we spent a good few years growing this business, building microsites, uh, interactive CD-ROMs, websites, uh, apps when they became a thing, and then social media when that became a thing. And it was good fun. Uh, it, we, we made it a success. But when we finished the end of that journey by selling the business to IPG, we came out the other end and wanted to do our own thing again. Um, we wanted it to be based in technology. Uh, our inner geeks wouldn't allow us to, to get rid of that completely. But we felt we'd left architecture behind a bit. And um, unfortunately, this is uh, nowhere near <laughs> the quality of, uh, of artwork. This is a Sterling Prize winner, Newport Street Gallery by Caruso St. John. But looking back at architecture and thinking, what do we believe are the, the traits of architectural design that we can take forward and practice and combine into a new business, a new business that has technology at its heart as well. And those three things are user centric. Um, this is something that all good architecture should be. You should be uh, thinking of the client at all times. What is this building going to be used for? Who is going to inhabit it? What are they going to use it for? And this is also something we've seen become a huge uh, part of um, modern agency landscape and, and design, design thinking. Um, the, the, the acronym UX wasn't a thing when we started in the mid 2000s and so now there's whole departments, if not companies that are based around user experience design. And the next is contextual. Um, at architecture school, it's drummed into us that site is 
critically important. The building must respond to the site. It must be contextual to the site and everything that goes on in that site, whether it's the physical attributes, the social attributes or the economic ones, uh, site contextual and narrative as well. Um, buildings tell stories. We all tell stories, websites tell stories, brands really want to be able to tell stories and sometimes succeed. And um, so these three things are what we thought, well, th these are the real powers of good architecture. Let's take that forward into our new business and let's come up with a company mission based on that. And this is it. This is the mission for Arcade XR is to connect people to place through play. Um, we've been lucky enough to work across a number of industries. Um, this show just shows clips from some of the work we've done. Um, but th those, those sectors include arts and culture, heritage, sports, entertainment, brands and marketing, um, the latter of which tend to pay the bills, the former of which are, are more our passion projects. And actually, particularly working in arts and culture, we've, we've managed to adhere more to our company mission of connecting people to place through play. What's also happened is we, we've not by design, but very welcome. Um, we've ended up doing a lot of experience for young audiences and for kids and connecting kids with, with culture as well. And one technology in particular has been profoundly useful to us in achieving that. It's not the only one, but it's one that we've used a lot and that's XR. Um, it's not Extinction Rebellion. Uh, it stands for Extended Reality, which I mean, it's a problem that the immersive sector has is naming. There are names for everything and multiple names for everything, but it feels like we've kind of got to a point where XR is now agreed as the capsule term for all the realities, except for Apple who call it spatial computing. And XR covers these three things. The first one being augmented reality. This is where you are still present and in your own real world space. And even as you look at a device, the camera feed or it's transparent, you can still see that space, but it is augmented with digital entities, whether they're 3D or 2D planes. In this case, it's a 3D virtual sofa placed to scale in your real world space to help you visualize your new IKEA purchase. Mixed reality, this is a bit of a, a curveball because it's exactly the same as augmented reality but people tend to use the term mixed reality instead when they're talking about headset based AR. So as you can see, this image here is of the Apple Vision Pro. It's a mixed reality headset, but what this guy is actually experiencing is AR. It's a digital entity in his real world space and you can still see his real world space, but it's been conveniently dimmed by the device because he's in cinema mood. And then virtual reality is where the user, by using a headset, is completely immersed 360 degrees in another world. They're not in their own space anymore. They are in a completely virtual one. Uh, this visual, if nobody's tried VR and wants to try it, say, once, this is the experience to do. It's a game called Beat Saber where your controllers in VR, you're actually holding two lightsabers and you smash blocks that are flying towards you in time with music. It's Transcendental, I think is the word I found it. Um, and I don't say that about many VR experiences. Um, as you can probably imagine, VR is not as useful as the other R's to Arcade and our mission to connect people to place through play. Um, we're more concerned with how do we make more of the real world and you know connecting people to that real world and creating experiences, shared experiences, the people you're there with. So VR can't quite achieve that, but it does have a place and we have done bits of work in it. I'm going to talk about two projects in particular um, that we've done over the years, which um, we think have achieved uh, getting kids to care about culture to some degree. The first one is the Keeper of Paintings and the Palette of Perception. This is uh, ultimately funded, was funded by the Arts and Humanities Research Council, uh, as well as uh, the National Gallery, and was run by um, a programme called Story Futures out of Royal Holloway University and in collaboration with Brunel University and multiple other ones as well, um, huge R&D project. Um, the brief to us was to create a child-led experience through the National Gallery that connects the kids with the National Collection whilst demonstrating the value of immersive technology. 
um, which is a great brief and we were very excited to get going, but there were two immediate challenges that came to mind. The first is the building itself. The National Gallery is imposing to most visitors, but particularly to little ones. It's, it's big, it's looming, it's dark, it's grand. It doesn't feel like it's there for them, quite the opposite in fact. And then we look at the National Collection. The National Collection is a series of paintings that until you get to the last couple of rooms where you might get some post-impressionism or something that's a bit more in their, in their world, it's uh, colonialism, topics of slavery, nudity, and large, not dusty, but kids probably perceive them as dusty, paintings that they can't really relate to. So some brilliant challenges from the off. And our solution was to, rather than take the existing learning material, because we worked very closely with the learning teams at the gallery on this project, um, rather than take that and try and enhance it or present it through a new lens or, or, or work with that, we started off by inventing a whole new story world, completely made up, uh, called the Keeper of Paintings. And this, this world of keepers is this liminal, magical space that exists all over the world. All places have a keeper, by the way. We just didn't know it until we made this up. Um, but the Keeper of Paintings experience is designed to get the kids into a game state into a game mode into a flow state even where they're playing through the gallery um so this is an ios and android app it's available for free it's on the app stores now it's into its third year and the gist of it is that the keeper of paintings has lost their gems their gems are the keeper's magic powers that help them look after preserve and keep these wonderful collection um, the keeper's cat, Claus Monet, has knocked the gems away and it's the kid's job to help the keeper retrieve these before paintings start fading and things start happening. Um, it's a conventional, traditional hero's quest journey when it comes to the narrative. And the keeper interacts with the kids through a very familiar interface to this generation, um, which is the chat interface. And they have moments of augmented reality where the characters appear and they actually interact with the artworks um, as they go through. And whilst this is a made up story, it ends up weaving in and out of the artworks and the stories that they tell as they go through the quest. There were three main innovations that we um, implemented in this project. So on the left hand side, this first one shows the chat interface and a problem that often happens with augmented reality is it's, it's quite a clunky experience on a mobile phone. You have to leave the, the user mode that you're currently in and then you go to a camera mode and you have to make something appear on the ground and then everything happens. And then you have to find your way back again. So we wanted to be more fluid than that. So we actually, as you can see in the video there, hopefully, uh, integrated the augmented reality moments into the chat interface to the point where they even get captured as mementos in your chat history. And then the second innovation um, is the first mention I'm going to make of artificial intelligence. This is AI of the computer vision variety. And we had a real challenge here where we need to recognize all of the artworks in the gallery because our experience is carefully controlled according to where the child is and what they're interacting with. We need to serve up the right piece of content. So to do that, we built a model that recognizes every artwork in the gallery. And as you can see in this video, instantly or near as instantly recognizes it as soon as the device is held up to a particular artwork. So from that, we then trigger the right part of narrative, the right part of the gameplay. What it means for the kid, and this is the crucial element, is that they have ultimate agency. They can go wherever they want in the gallery. They can play the rooms in whatever order they want. If they look at their map and decide there might be something to collect over there, off they go and we pick it up and we adapt. Um, in an earlier uh, phase of the project, when we did the alpha testing with kids in the galleries, we didn't have this. We were using AR marker recognition, which meant we had to tell the kid to go to a particular room so we could then program it to spot the nine or 10 paintings in that room, because that's all that technology is capable of spotting before it falls down. Whereas by implementing this computer vision, we were able to build in all of the artworks in the gallery. And actually, the paintings get moved around so much by, by the National Gallery. They go on loan or they go back into storage. But what we do is train the model every time the app is loaded up and you start your quest in the gallery. It takes about five to 10 seconds, depending on the device. 
the AI model is retrained with any new data that's needed from their API according to painting movements. So the app is always up to date and the kids are always able to progress through in this uh, free agency way. And then finally, it's not a technological innovation. This one is, is a user experience one. Um, and we didn't know if this would work. We introduced it in beta testing. The gallery was intrigued, but none of us were sure. We timed the technology out. We freeze the screen. We stop the device from being useful for periods of 60 to 90 seconds. We did test it for longer and we were pushing it. But what it turns out we've done is by getting the kids into this game flow state, into this excited play mode, we've earned the right to then actually freeze the technology and force this moment of real world interaction. So these skill cards, in the case of the one in this video, it's from Claws the cat, is asking for a group challenge. So try prowling around this room in different ways. Discuss what you can see if you move around and look at paintings from different angles. Um, put your device away while you prowl and you get a reward of XP points for doing this as well. Um, this actually gets triggered in the room with the ambassadors painting in. So those of you who know it will know what you'll see if you look from a different angle at that particular piece. So what did this result in? Well, it's into its third year. It was meant to be a year long R&D pilot, but the galleries uh, commissioned it from us to, to carry on going. And it's increased five star ratings by 300 percent. I must say it's, it's amazing doing a project with so many universities. You get some really good data and research done <laughs> alongside uh, alongside it. Um, it's increased visit time by 40 minutes. Those who use the experience and the app compared to those who don't. And 46 percent of players are actually repeat visitors. And it's this fact that excited us the most when we started seeing messages like this come through and emails and tweets to the National Gallery where parents are just amazed that the kids are the ones dragging them back to somewhere like the National Gallery. This is why we said Arcade XR up and this is getting kids to care about culture. Um, there are other educational um, stats which we're waiting on because the report's not finalised yet but the top level is that um, the kids' education and understanding and willing to visit the rest of the gallery has increased as a result of this as well. Another part of the brief was to engage kids remotely. There are kids who can't or won't visit the gallery. And actually, we did this project. We started during COVID. So a remote experience was essential. And we said from the very beginning to the gallery and Story Futures that we're really reluctant to build an arts and culture app for the home expecting any kid to download and use it unless they're really forced to. And that's not a mode we want to encourage. So using the marketing adage, uh, fish where the fish are, we went to Roblox and this is actually the remote experience. This is a live Roblox game that we built where we took the national collection or I say 10 pieces in high res from the national collection into Roblox and crafted a whole new game around it where kids complete mini side quests for different keeper characters to earn these paintings, they then hang in their own gallery that they curate, that they can invite their friends to and show off their own version of the National Collection. So taking that ownership of it to a, an almost literal sense. Um, this actually came about from another important facet of this project, and that is co-creation. We, uh, from the very beginning, set up a children's advisory group. We worked with two schools and met on a weekly basis on Zoom with classes to co-create this experience. Not the Roblox one, but the whole thing, the one in the National Gallery as well. Um, and it's quite challenging, as we know. I mean, this is challenging. We're on a, we're on a equivalent of a Zoom call here. Um, especially challenging when it's the end of a school day, the kids have already spent all day online learning. And then you have to speak to a bunch of people they don't know about co-creating an experience in a national gallery. So from the very beginning, what we actually did was, as well as being on the Zoom call, we created a simple Roblox environment that we threw some of the national gallery content into, uh, as well as some fun experiments that we were just playing around with and said to the kids, when you join the Zoom, also join the Roblox environment we sent them the link to. And we all hung out in there together and immediately the the breakdown of any of those kind of um cautious or shy behavior was gone and the kids were just rushing with these amazing ideas and charging around like lunatics and just amazing way to break down a barrier by literally 
going to the space where they feel most comfortable that they own and we are visitors. The second project um, is called Time Odyssey. Um, it's funded by Art Explorer and the British Museum, uh, but it's actually designed for the British Museum and a number of other museums around the country. It's going to roll out later this year. It would have already been in the British Museum um, at the end of last year, but for reasons of um, things going a bit awry in the, uh, in the museum, uh, it's been delayed. But um, this project is, uh, sorry, Stone aside. This project is using tablets, tablets that have been already bought by the museums and by Art Explorers. So they exist uh, on site, ready for kids to use when they visit as a school group. So this is designed for key stage two, uh, seven to 11 year old classes who visit the museum. And it was a similar challenge. How do we connect these kids with the uh, collections? Um, how do we get them engaging with the collections and how do we make the most of this technology where already the status quo um, does quite a good job? You know, the, the good ones do where you have uh, pen and paper or pencil and paper, uh, treasure hunts, you know, brass rubbings, those kind of things. Um, so what we took inspiration for for this one was creativity. And the fact that museums are places of huge creativity, they are every single object in there is a, is a creation and artists use them as inspiration. Artists visit museums all the time to be inspired. So we said, what if these devices, these tablets are creation devices for the kids? So again, similar to the last project, we came up with a narrative and that narrative is four characters, the same age as the kids, have been misplaced in time and space. So one character from the Cheng Dynasty, one from ancient Egypt, from Roman Britain. Um, the kids were, get into groups of two or three and they share the tablet. And at the beginning, what's happening here, they choose which one of these characters they want to help. And the way the groups of kids help these characters is by creating them objects for them to travel safely back through time and space. They create a cloak, they create an amulet, they create a tome, they create a vessel. And the way they create these objects is taking it in turns in their group. They capture elements like you see here from the uh, objects, the collections. This is a digital brass rubbing that you can do on a large object. You can do that on an object behind glass. The amulet you do by capturing zoomed in textures. The tome, you collect words using optical character recognition. So again, we're using computer vision. That same flavor of AI we used before to turn these devices into hugely creative ones. One of the big challenges of museum school visits is keeping control of a class of kids. It's hard enough when you visit as parents with one or two or three, um, they want to race off. But when you have a whole class, it's a nightmare. And um, to help with that, what we also did was create a teacher's tablet and a parent tablet, which what the kids need to do to trigger each chapter, they need to come back and scan the, the teacher tablet, which then transfers energy. I mean, it's all under the guise of transferring energy, but what it's really doing is creating this, this ebb and flow where the kids go out, do their, we call them creative engagement tasks, come back, share what they've done with their teacher, and then they're ready to go on to the next moment. So we have this really nice pace and control of the experience. We have a really nice way of offering these, these moments, these reflective prompt moments, we call them, where the teacher's tablet's giving them the required reflective prompts to ask the teams, you know, why did you choose these objects for your cloak? And it might be they were asked to find the strongest or the oldest or the lightest object in the room, but they can then talk about, well, I chose this sword and the texture on it because it was rusty and it was old and it felt really important or whatever their reason might be. Again, this project was um, co-created from the very beginning. These are some of the early sketches by some of the school groups we worked with. Um, and again, the importance of having those kids imagination firing, um, filling in the big gaps where our, our old imagination fails us. Um, and in terms of um, how it's been received, uh, it's been you know, tested in a variety of museums with, with different school children, with 500 school children, I think. And this was our favourite quote from a teacher who had a class with um, a mixture of um, kids with autism, uh, ADHD, a selective mute, um, uh, and it goes on and on. Um, she, she was really impressed with how it was just appealing to every single one, um, which was really um, humbling to hear. 
And an example of if this technology is done right, um, as complex as it might be in the background, to use as a user, it you know it can be really simple and easy. Um, on the subject of accessibility as well, with the previous project, a national gallery, we did a fair bit of work with a company called Open Inclusion, which I forgot to mention earlier, um, who actually did tests with one of our early prototypes um, with groups of children with, with various special needs in the gallery. And out of that, a whole load of workshops and um, ma managed to summarise a priority list of accessibility features to work on. And things that surprised us, for example, was that a screen reader went so far down the list that it didn't end up getting implemented. And there was actually a whole load of other stuff like different visual contrast ratio options for people with visual autism, for example. Um, things like that made it higher up the list. So we, we implemented a, you know, a whole range of features uh, off the back of that. So the, sort of hopefully that's given an idea of technologies like XR and computer vision flavor of AI has helped us um, craft experiences that get kids to care about culture. Um, moving on to AI and what people tend to mean by this at the moment is generative AI because that's the, the big thing. Um, we've always wanted to build a product as an agency. It's a common thing <laughs> that agencies have this agency product kind of dilemma. We're always building things for other people and we've got quite good at that. What if we built one for ourselves and released it as a, as a software, as a service, for example? And Looking back at all this work we've done, we've done these digital learning experiences for kids. And so we want to build and we are building our own digital learning experience for kids. And because the experiences we've done have been hugely narrative driven, um, generative AI just seems like the perfect technology to underpin this new venture. So this is KeeperQuest, the educational AI game platform. This is our, our new venture, which I'm, I'm going to finish with. It's addressing this, that literacy is the path to learning. You know, if, if you learn to read, right, then the rest of education opens up to you. But in this country, 41% of children leave primary school without meeting the expected literacy and maths levels. 20% of 15 year olds have a reading age of 11 or below. And it's sad we're falling behind. 29% of English children enjoy reading versus 46% internationally. So, all of this experience we've got creating these play-based digital learning experiences, we were also realising we were designing for a younger and younger reading age. The requests were coming in that that bit of narrative needs revising, it's too complex. And again, we're simplifying, we're removing words, we're reducing words. So we decided to use the world of Keeper's IP that you've seen some of already and do something about it. So Keeper Quest boosts students' literacy through conversational AI game characters that engage children in personalised and fun learning adventures. Importantly, it's also about optimising teachers' time. So insights that the system provides for teachers allows them to pinpoint areas where they can spend meaningful one-to-one -one time with pupils. The idea is that you access these magical adventures from home and from school. It's really accessible and inclusive. It's a web-based platform for mobile, tablet and laptop. And just to mention, we're not talking about XR at all here. XR as a technology is still to come, really, for, for being useful as a, a massively accessible uh, project such as this. Um, the way you play the game is with the power of words. You type words to explore a cave, you can type words to obviously converse with the characters um, and each time these words are being scored in the background you're being rewarded by good punctuation or grammar, you're being rewarded for manners, for empathy even. And this is the power of generative AI in an education setting and it's something that those of you who are in this space will be well aware of, this one-to-one -one AI tutor um, facility that could be provided by generative AI. So in ours, um, we have AI tutors, but they are game characters, they're NPCs. They appear in this game world because what we've learned from our digital learning experiences, yes, you can create an AI tutor and it can help you with a maths exercise or go through an exercise book with you. But what if you were playing a game, but you still had the curriculum elements coming in through that and you'd have those curriculum elements built into the AI system 
from partners like the National Gallery and British Museum, who we're talking to about this project at the moment as well, and maybe educational publishers as well. And so the kind of interface looks like this. You've got this beautiful game world that you're exploring. You're exploring real world locations based on the Key Stage 2 curriculum. Each quest set in a real location like Roman Britain, Jurassic Coast or Ancient Egypt. Uh, you meet the keepers. The keepers are there to challenge you, give you quests, side quests. And personalised avatars, you, do, you have your own avatar and your sidekick. Your sidekick is also an AI agent who's always there to help and offer hints. And the power of words that you get badges, you get rewards and you get rewarded for different things that might involve empathy. It might involve how you how you behave. And importantly, the teachers and parents get um, the, the dashboard as well. They can dive into. But what you see on the screen here is the AI conversational summary, which with a teacher can straight away say, these two students are struggling with similes. Maybe they benefit from some one-to-one -one time with you in the next available lesson. Um, would you like to see a lesson plan? Yes, and it's all these kind of things which make it rapid for teachers to get the most useful resources that they can then do what they are essential for, which is spending one-to-one -one time with, with kids in their class. Um, this is sort of a diagram you might see elsewhere that, that sort of um, explains something called RAG, Retrieval Augmented Generation. This is how to make an existing language model, an existing AI, even more contextually aware, even more accurate, even more safe by introducing your own data stores and your own data to it. So from the left, the prompt that comes in from the user is turned into a query to an API. And what the API can do is in, provide an enhanced context for that prompt before it goes to the AI language model. The language model can also be fine-tuned, which can help with uh, a better understanding of reading levels and literacy protocols before then the prompt and the enhanced context is sent back. So it means you can make it safer, you can make it more accurate, and a big concern um, is clearly the safety and the removal of bias when it comes to education um, and massive steps are already being made by others in the space. Um, in fact, uh, Salman Khan from Khan Academy has already got a, an AI tutor that's in beta at the moment uh, called Khan Migo and has written a book about it and there's some amazing insights in that book about how it's been working and how they've tested it with teachers and how it has shown an ability to be unbiased, it has shown an ability to really offer this one-to-one -one personalized education path somehow you know some students are coming out of their shell because they didn't want to open up and fear making a mistake in front of another human being but in front of an AI much more willing to to give more back um, top right is Google's LearnLM, it's a large language model that Google are working on for higher education and then companies like Synthesis who are building AI tutors for use in the home. So AI, XR, technologies, computer vision, um, they're always the means to the end, they're not how we define what we do. But in terms of summarising the, the question of this uh, lecture, um, how do we get kids to care about culture? Well, first of all, co-create the experience with them. Make sure they're at the heart of it from the very beginning as well. Give them agency. Make sure they are not being told what to do. Give them as much agency as possible. And finally, let them play. For us and our experience, it's something that is, is widely debated and discussed. And I understand it's a contentious topic of play to learn um, when it comes to teaching in school. But we're bringing this to our EdTech platform because our experience has shown overwhelmingly that if you get kids into a game flow state, then the learning happens. The learning really does just come on. Finally, um, I'm sure most of you, if not all, probably got what this device is, uh, but this is a book. So this quote from a, uh, I think it's an 18th century medical journal, and it's it's sort of typical of a reaction that happens to all new technologies as they come along, wave after wave. Um, and it's not something to be ignored, but it's also something to, you know, to, to bear in mind that there's this immediate resistance that can often be misplaced. Thank you. Well, that was uh, remarkable. Uh, when I think I go back to chalk, chalk, blackboards and uh, even Victorian pens with ink made out of uh, out of powder. Uh, it is really a totally different world. 
uh, the first thing that crosses my mind is, of course, do parents or do I dare say grandparents actually need training to be able to use something like KeeperQuest? Would you need a parent's evening or a diploma of some sort to be able to make use of this? <laughs> well, <laughs> the answer is no, of course. It's going to be so easy to use, Tim, that, um, I mean, you saw that screenshot on the teacher's slide that the homepage is a conversation, a chat interface with the teacher's AI. So the AI will be there to say, welcome to the dashboard, and you'll, you might say hi, and they'll say, what would you like to do? And you might say, I have no idea what I'm doing, tell me, and they'll be able to tell you. So as well as being adaptive to the literacy levels and the learning levels of each individual child on the teacher slash parent slash grandparent side, it will adapt to your level as well. And that, that's the real magic of, of generative AI, I think, is that, that true personalization. So rather than being taught in classes of 40 where we were sitting in straight lines with Victorian uh, wooden desks, uh, the whole thing really revolves around these fairly small electronic devices. Um, are they all available, easily available, or are they very expensive to obtain? They, they, they're, more, they're more present in schools than you might realise, and especially in, um, in junior schools, in, in sort of key, at key stage two. Um, but it is, it is a consideration, which is why we want this to be playable at home as well, and there to be a way for children who don't have access to the technology, uh, either at home or at school, can get it in the other place. Um, but in terms of the class setup, it's still massive classes of kids in a room. Um, quite often these days they have devices, maybe in groups, maybe individually. Um, the idea eventually is this will work for groups as well, because um, it's really important to, to facilitate that. Um, but the teacher is able to, from their screen, very quickly identify areas they can make the most difference. And rather than um, communicate with the whole class and aim in the middle, and the, the kids who are further ahead aren't getting anything from it, the kids who are behind aren't keeping up with it, and they're just hitting a small middle area of, of children to, um, to teach, they're able to be much more efficient with what is still essential. I think it's important to say none of this is to replace teachers, it's very much to uh, help them and enhance the, the teaching, the learning process in class. Right, well, you've, you've had a piece of fan mail already. Kira Vaklovic has said this is both fascinating and brilliant. But could you please just go over again, what happens when there's a rehang at the National Gallery? Uh, do they have to do anything special at their end, or do you just update at yours? No, we don't do anything at either end. It's all automatic, because they keep their API up to date on every rehang and every movement. So whenever you load up the app, if you're connected to the internet, it checks whether there's been an update. If there has, it automatically retrieves thumbnails of those paintings, trains them again into the, the AI model on your device. Uh, and this can happen on an iPhone 6S. It can happen on what is now a very old device. That one takes 10 seconds, whereas you do it on a new iPhone, it takes two seconds. But it's very quick and it happens before you start the adventure and it means it's always up to date. And, we don't need to do anything. They've closed parts of the um, gallery at the moment. So when there's a massive change like that, where rooms are closed, we've even built in a little CMS for them where they can flag that a room's closed and we move the gem automatically to another room. And we have clues set up in each room so that we can facilitate their, their wins that they have because the National Gallery does like to uh, change things up a lot. <laughs> now, and also, I'd like to thank for that um, insight of the uh, books being actually feared by parents and uh, adults when they first came out as something that will keep children indoors. It was Kira who inspired that. So hopefully I did it justice with the quote I found, Kira. But anyway. Okay. Now you've mentioned the National Gallery and the British Museum, both of which are sort of, uh, I suppose, historically rather interactive. You go to watch, you go to look. Uh, what about visiting uh, major buildings? What about things like cathedrals or uh, historic locations? Can you apply this sort of technology to those? Yeah, absolutely. We've got an, uh, an experience that's currently live at Glastonbury Abbey, where you don't even have most of the buildings because they're ruins. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we don't have paintings to uh, recognise there to trigger things. What we did was working with an architectural firm, actually, and this was um, sponsored out of... Um, I think it was AHRC again through Reading University and... Um, we created these um, stone markers that are now set into the site in different locations. 
that in your app you're, you're told to go and find one and when you scan it it opens up a portal which recreates uh, the abbey or the, the chapel or the lady chapel and elements of the site um, all the while um, maintaining this narrative that you are uh, collecting artifacts and placing them back where they belong in these these moments in time um, so yeah it, it could be an empty field and we can craft an experience um, with with technology it's come on so much that actually just using gps and we say right we know you're there um we don't know it to a, a huge degree of accuracy but we know it enough to craft a, a narrative driven experience via your mobile device well you've you've said that this is all really rather fast moving so i think the question in everybody's mind is uh, do you think that ai is a good thing or is it something we should actually be rather frightened of it seems to be moving very very fast and I'm not sure anyone really understands it properly. Yeah, absolutely. I think the answer is both. <laughs> I find it is incredibly exciting because, and it's the same thing you can say about social media. It's the same thing you can say about, you know, mobile technology, but probably less extent. AI is scary because it is moving so fast. And actually, as a technological wave, it, it has its ability to, um, feed in on itself and make itself better and we haven't got to that stage yet where it's um artificial general intelligence where it, it can self-learn but the common belief i think in industry is we're not that far off that point um the other reason why it's scary is nobody in the industry including the people who actually built these language models understand exactly how they work underneath it it is a form of magic and the scientists can't actually describe that how it's working it, it's working in the same way as a human brain well you know tell us more um uh the reason why it's um also potentially scary is um i think it's uh i can't remember the name of the book now but um it's coming along at the same time as synthetic biology so the combination of you know ai and synthetic biology is quite potent and having two big waves coming along at once that can affect each other is is scary but the benefits it can bring and we're just talking in our world and looking at education but in all sorts of other sectors the benefits are are massive and it will replace jobs like other technology and it already is replacing jobs like other technology uh, has that's inevitable but it's how it can be used as a tool to enhance our lives and our, our work is is what we're interested in you mentioned synthetic biology that sounds to me like another topic for one of the lord mayor's lectures but we'll have to work on that um, <laughs> just to round off to show how far ai is going um the latest edition of stationers news um the editor had a bit of fun he took part of the uh, master's mid-year speech and turned it into a shakespearean sonnet and let's have a try at this it's hard to believe that i'm over halfway through my year as master it's been a very busy few months as it should be and a great opportunity to make new acquaintances across the city of London. Without exception, our hall is referred to in a warm and positive manner. As the second oldest livery hall in the city of London, with its old world charm and grade one listing, coupled with excellent culinary support from Circe's and wine selection from our very own wine committee, people look forward to events at Stationers Hall. Since I last wrote to you, we have greeted the new Lord Mayor Michael Manelli at our civic dinner. This was a very special evening for me. Now, this is what Shakespeare tells us. This is the master's mid-year reflection as a sonnet. Tis wondrous strange that I, O half, have passed. Through this my year as master, swift to flee. The months so busy have been filled and cast with chance to weave new friends in London sea. Our hall so praised stands second, old yet fair, with charm that hails from ancient days of yore. Its grade one listed walls with grace declare and culinary arts and wines adore. Events at Stationers Hall do men await. With joy they come, with joy they leave our gate. The new Lord Mayor, with pomp and grand estate, we welcome with a night to celebrate. Especially if for me it shines so bright, midway I stand, reflecting on this light. And just to rub it in, he then did a letter from Charles Dickens to his wife, a master's lament by Christopher Marlowe, and a detective mystery with Detective Inspector James Harker, who is based in Kentucky, though I won't read that out, of course. Um, I think it just goes to show that this is going in all sorts of directions and undoubtedly is going to uh, affect our lives in ways we haven't really even thought about yet. But uh, I'm afraid that's all the time we have now for questions. But 
It's worth mentioning that if you've enjoyed this session, you might look elsewhere among the Lord Mayor's lectures for other topics relating to AI, which seems to be moving at such an incredible pace. So, in fact, you can tune in again next September to hear about revolutionizing training. There's John telling me we're all going to lose our jobs, but there we are, human centered and ethical AI. Now, what about that? Back to business topics, of course, plenty of those in the Lord Mayor's lectures. The city and Wall Street, two markets, of course, divided by the same language. And uh, one of my favorites coming up uh, next Friday, bearing in mind that the Lord Mayor is also Admiral of the Port of London, uh, a safe, sustainable and thriving port for London. So finally, thanks to you all, the uh, audience, for your interest and support in the Lord Mayor's lectures. And of course, thank you very much indeed to John Meggett, who has really given us a serious insight into the kind of things which are coming up, the kind of things which as parents and grandparents, we're going to have to try and get our heads around. And when you say to the children, what did you do, at school, do today at school, uh, you could find yourself uh, hearing some very, very interesting things. Now, this lecture, all our lectures are recorded and posted on the Gresham Society website and on our YouTube channel, just in case you'd like to revisit anything else. We hope to see you again for another lecture in the Knowledge Mile series. And don't let's forget the uh, Lord Mayor's theme for the year, which is Connect to Prosper. So thank you to John for talking. Thank you very much for viewing and goodbye.